So Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Finn, I'm so excited to chat with you today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, could you just kick us off by telling us a little bit about your background and what you do today? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I, I dabble in biophysics or quantum physics, and I guess I should say I teach how to apply quantum biology to human physiology to optimize health and performance. And it wasn't something that, you know, I didn't wake up one day and say like, oh yeah, I really want to study quantum physics and how it affects the human body. <laughs> like a lot of people kind of in this health space, you know, my own health needed support. And as I was just figuring out my career in life, I happened to, you know, be, become a personal trainer. I happened to become a uh, certified massage therapist. And, and all along I was finding out what does the human body need to thrive, you know? And at first, just fresh out of college, you know, it, it was along the lines of, oh, well, exercise, right? We have to have the perfect workout strategy. Um, and so, you know, I became a personal trainer. I opened my a fitness studio here. Uh, and I, I liked it, but it was like, okay, clients are, are, they feel good after a workout, but you know, they're not getting results, be it metabolic results, be it, um, better sleep, better focus, energy, things like that. And so I was like, there's something else to this. And so I kind of, you know, having a, studied an undergrad, undergrad, a very Western mindset of pre-med, um, I knew that that wasn't the the route that I wanted to dive deeper into. So instead, I basically, I kind of flipped that on its head. And I said, well, I want to go to massage therapy school and become a certified massage therapist. And that gave me a completely different view of energy in the body, of um, flow in the body, how the body kind of communicates in interesting ways. Um, and, you know, I would give massage. And it would make people feel good, right? And there was some improvement in the tissue, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't it, you know? And it wasn't, it that, you know, fast forward a few, you know, five or seven years after that, I have my first son and my health just tanks. Um, it, it, from a functional perspective, I was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, but basically it was the worst fatigue plus insomnia at the same time, mm. digestive bloat, pain, uh, just, just felt like crap. <laughs> and so, you know, as I'm trying to kind of figure things out, I, I thought, okay, well, you know, obviously I'm missing something. And so I found nutrition, um, dove deep into nutrition, got a master's degree in clinical nutrition, and it moved the needle a little bit too, but again, it wasn't it, right? It's like, is this how I'm supposed to feel? Like, you know, you hear, oh, as a mom, this is how you feel. Or when you hit 40, just, you know, you're going to feel like you're going to start to go down here, like those things. And, um, I just didn't, I didn't buy it. I was like, that's BS, right? I don't buy into that. And so there, I was like, I'm missing something. And, you know, guarantee you, I was up one, one night scrolling on my phone. Like, why am I not sleeping? Why is my kid not <laughs> sleeping? And I kind of got slapped across the face with a blog from Dr. Jack Cruz, who is a neurosurgeon, who's really big in, bridging the gap between how physics applies to the human body. And he, he basically, he's, he's very blunt. He's basically like your lighting environment. If, if you know, if you have health issues, your lighting environment sucks. And I was like, well, that's pretty bold, but he laid out such a fascinating science that he called quantum biology. Um, and I was hooked. I dove into quantum biology about, gosh, it's probably been about eight to 10 years now. And, um, it's been the game changer. But when I learned how to apply light to improve my energy, my health, my sleep, um, it was it for me. And so mm -hmm. that's basically a, what I tell, teach people now. And I teach it to health professionals as well, how to apply light, how to put, how the water in our body operates to, to create energy for us. And that actually all deals with the quantum scale of the body. So I'm a quantum clinician mm -hmm. kind of by default now, uh, looking at the body from a very, very uh, new perspective of what we would call quantum mm -hmm. biology. Yeah, it's super new. Like the, the the main perspectives we have, exactly as you've said, and it's your evolution and your journey is like fitness and strength and movement of the mm -hmm. body, and then looking at nutrition and how different macronutrients affect, and then even micronutrients. But this is a whole nother wave. So try if you might but can you lay this out about how physics does affect the body sure and that is such a i mean i could speak uh, you know do a 10-part lecture on that right but i want people <laughs> to recognize that what we recognize as a body is a collection of cells 
And those cells are made up of proteins and molecules and organelles. And each one of those things is made up of atoms, right? And so we kind of get back to like the periodic table of elements. You know, maybe we've heard about that at some point. And each one of those atoms is made up of a combination, a unique combination of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So I am a big body full of collectively organized protons, electrons, and neutrons. And if I recognize that in physics, we look at, that's what we're looking at is the behavior of those particles and that we can influence those particles. For example, photons, light energy can energize electrons. Um, if, I, if I can understand the body at that scale and apply some strategies, I can actually influence the behavior of my chemistry. I can actually influence the behavior of hormones and things like that by looking at the body from that part, basically subatomic molecular or subatomic particle scale. And I don't believe in particles. It's lots of, lots of, it's just waves of energy, but that's how, that sounds way too woo for most people. So <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. to, don't worry, we got to like layer in the woo as yeah. things go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so even, even on from there. So, so how does that apply in practice? I mean, like, it, it's a, it's a shift in perspective and how we think from basically like a a very um, sort of layered nutritional aspect to this much deeper impact of sort of quantum mechanics whereby everything around us is affecting us. So can you tell us how that applies in practice in terms of, I, I guess we could start with light. Yeah, let's, we can start with light and then water is another really interesting perspective for that. Um, but so, so light is made up of what we would call colors, right? And you, everyone has seen light through a prism or a rainbow and it gets divided up into the colors of the rainbow. And, and so that, and, and then light also, it contains what we would call wavelengths that we physically can't see. The human eye can only see a very small percentage of the waves of light coming from the sun. And so just outside of our visible spectrum, you would have the ultraviolet light. We've all heard of UV light and then the infrared. And those colors of light that are coming from the sun, they actually get, they interact with my body in different ways. Like my body can absorb the energy in those wavelengths. So the, this is just light photons traveling on a wave from the sun and they come in contact with my body. And depending on the wavelength, sometimes depending on the time of day and depending on where it, where it basically touches my body can, can influence so many biological processes could, could from my a, so An example of that, of like the different parts of the body where the light hits, how it might impact differently. Sure. So the, the, the key area where light, where we, I guess, kind of absorb light or suck in light because that it's, it's got a, a fluid to it is the eye. The eye is basically just a concentrator of light. And so the, and we don't have to stare directly at the sun to get the light because the light acts like a wave, right? And so, you know, if I were to tell you um, in, in order to get into water, it's like getting into water, right? You don't have to touch one little pathway of water in a pool to get the effect of the water. Same thing with light. When I go outside into natural light, into sunlight, I get all of the colors that are coming at that given time, depending on what's coming from the sun. And that varies very, very predictably from sunrise till solar noon back to sunset. But when my eyes pick up certain wavelengths, it can, it can do really, really key things. And one of the, one of the things that I found to be most practical for people is recognizing when a wavelength appears in their region, in their location called UVA or ultraviolet A. So ultraviolet A is a wavelength of light um, that actually when it interacts with amino acids in our eyes, specific types of amino acids have a very specific ring shape to them, aromatic amino acids. When those eyes soak in the energy from a UVA light, that energy actually take that it gets trapped by these ring shaped amino acids and it provides the catalyst to convert these amino acids into something else. So for example, one of these amino acids, acids is called tryptophan, right? Tryptophan. Tryptophan we hear about in America after Thanksgiving because it's like that amino acid that you eat too much turkey and you feel really tired, really mm. sleepy because it's a calming amino acid. Well, you know, you've got this concentration of tryptophan in your eyes, essentially, that is waiting to capture UVA light. And as soon as it does, it takes you from, and that happens in the morning, right? That's about an hour to two after sunrise. It takes you from feeling groggy, which is that turkey effect, to it converts that tryptophan into serotonin serotonin gives us drive and pleasure and curiosity and that and it happens simply from the wavelengths of light 
Um, the same thing can happen. There's a similar effect to an amino acid there called tyrosine or phenylalanine another aromatic amino acid that when it gets uh, triggered by UVA light, it can become dopamine. It can become norepinephrine, epinephrine, melanin. Um, and I'm not, not just talking about melanin in the skin. There's melanin in our, inside all of our body, including our brain. And it, it's an actually an energetic molecule. It's an energy donating molecule in the body. And we get that from the interaction of amino acids and UVA light in our eyes. So once you see like, wait, that actually is a thing that actually happens. It's a no brainer for me to schedule a walk or a phone call or take my laptop outside during UVA light in the morning. So I can get those things happening and get the beneficial effect of boosting serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine to have focus, drive energy, motivation. And, and this, this stimulation is coming when we bring it back to the quantum level, I'm not a quantum mechanic, but when we bring it back to that quantum level, this is just that we're having these photons from the, the sun or, the, or these ultraviolet waves and sure. they're stimulating the, 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 uh, the amino acids or what are they stimulating? The electrons they're stimulating in the amino acids. Or... Right. So light acts with electrons. And so these particular amino acids are made up in part of electrons and these electrons can get energized. So electrons, when they interact with a photon of light, they basically, they do something called jump orbits or they, they just gather more potential energy. And that potential energy can turn into a biochemical downstream. It can trigger a biochemical pathway or biochemical cascade. Um, and th so we, we think of energy coming solely from food. We think of energy... Um, I mean, you know, I would say food is really, you know, based, you, you think to yourself, oh, food breaks down into electrons. It, I mean, if you actually take it to the lowest, the lowest, the next step, you think you, originally we think food becomes macronutrients, right? We're really mm -hmm. concerned about carbs and fats and things like that. That's the big talk in the nutrition space, which is an interesting conversation. But then when you recognize that all food does is break down into electrons, specifically the carbs and the fats break down into electrons that go to the mitochondria to make ATP, this thing called ATP, you're like, wait a second. So electrons do matter. And we know then that the electrons that literally are just, we're full of electrons. Those electrons are waiting to interact with light to get more energy embedded in them to then do a cascade, do an effect in the body. And these days living indoors, we don't get any UV light, right? we're missing that. Mm. And so it's very easy to see how we're depleted in a certain way, you know, deficient in light nutrients, light energy, uh, because UVA light is not present in most indoor environments. And, and how about the, I've, I've heard you speaking a few times about the morning light spectrum and, and sort of sunrise and sunset. So could you tell us about those different spectrums of light, you know, before, I guess the, Firstly, the definition of what sunrise is, like, is that before it gets above the horizon or what? Like, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So like, like I was saying before, light, the light from the sun, it changes. It doesn't look like the same blend of the rainbow and the infrared and ultraviolet. It doesn't stay the same all day long. It varies very, very minutely, but very predictably all day long, which is actually how we tell time in our body, right? Our body tells time, our circadian rhythm tells time by the light, by the colors of light, specifically blue light, but we can go into that later. Um, but what happens is like, you know, at sunrise, if I were to take my spectrometer out, I've got my spectrometer somewhere. Um, it's this device that measured my kids play around with this stuff all the time. Right. So, um, it's this device that measures, I, it would literally take a snapshot of the colors of light that are available. And so if I take my spectrometer out at sunrise, I see a fairly balanced amount of red and blue wavelengths of light before that, before sunrise, you know, there is blue there, but it's just not strong enough for, for my, for my blue sensors. I've got these sensors in my eyes and skin called melanopsin receptors for blue light. Those sensors aren't able to pick up that there's blue there, but at sunrise, which is defined as when the sun comes over the horizon at sunrise, the blue and the red balance each other out and are intense enough to start my circadian clock, my circadian rhythm, which means that my eyes see the blue, they capture the blue and the red. And I've got a direct connection between my eyes and my brain called my retino, my retina, retino hypothalamic tract, hypothalamus. And right there in that area is my clock in my brain called my suprachiasmatic nucleus. And literally it tells the time. And so 
sunrise, boom, my brain knows it's sunrise. It knows the day has begun. And it communicates that message via something called oscillations, which is a weird thing to think of, but it literally communicates via waves and vibrations um, to every cell in my body. Every cell in my body has clock genes, right? There's a gene for gene expression. And so all of a sudden my cells know, oh, turn on this protein, production of this protein, turn off production of that protein, start ramping this pathway up, start taking this pathway down. And it's all based on that initial hit of red, balanced red and blue at sunrise. Mm. And no, you don't have to physically see the sun come over the horizon. It can be cloudy, rainy, foggy, snowy. You just have to be outside near that time in order to get the signal to happen because your eyes will soak in the color. You, those receptors will pick up the color, um, whether you see the sun coming over the horizon or not. And that time is like just before sunrise, just before the sun comes over the horizon. It's, you know, like if, if I were to give people a window, it's about three minutes before to three minutes after, you know, okay. and that's a small time frame. but literally all you need is a hit. I tell people, if you're going to time your sun, your, your light exposure to kind of get these signals, because that's what these are. These are signals that we use to do things. You get a hit of sunrise, but you get a big old gulp of UV, right? That UVA, that initial UV when it appears in your environment. And so that's, I mean, obviously the UV comes later, but, but yeah, all you got to do is get that. You got to get a consistent stimulus of that, you know, most days of the week in order just to set that circadian clock, set that circadian clock over and over and over again. And then you can reinforce mm. it at sunset as well. Mm. Um, but that morning light is special because as the colors layer themselves on, it's like triggering little domino effects in the body. Mm -hmm. And so you need that, like those little hits of those sequences triggered because everything in the body works on a cycle. And so I have to start the cycle in order for it to then become this next thing, this next thing, this next thing. And it, a lot of us are just not able to, we, we don't start the cycle because we don't get outside at this time. And we just don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And, and things like, I mean, to top of mind for me, like things like our phone, the light from our phone, the light from the screens, the light from just synthetic indoor light, that can all interfere. And I want to hear about how we can maybe mitigate that stuff. I, I see you wearing some funky glasses there. So I want to talk a little bit about them. But in terms of how, um, is it enough to just open the blinds in the morning? Not unless you've got uh, open air windows, because these days the, the, the way of the world is energy conservation and energy conservation means that our <coughs> wind, our window panes now block the majority of the red and the infrared. So we're getting an artificial signal. And before that, you're right, right. We, we turn on our cell phones, right. And that's a signal that's got all blue, no red. So if I were to hold my little meter up to that, it'd be like this big old spike of blue and in nature, there's never just blue from the sun. It's always got red. It's either red dominant or there's always a balance between red and blue. And the, all light bulbs and screens these days are missing the red. And so it's a very confusing signal. It's not giving us the right, it's not triggering the right dominoes because of that. It's just a very confusing signal. Hmm. Um, oh, go ahead. And, and because top of mind, you're saying that very rarely do you get all blue signals. Like very popular now is like, red light therapy sure. and that presumably top of mind for me is that's an all red signal so like is that healthy or is that just as unbalanced as all blue it's it's just as unbalanced but it's used in a small therapeutic dose so if you look at the database i mean i've probably reviewed about five thousand red light therapy studies and there is a therapeutic window that you use it and if you use it too much it actually can create harm. And so that therapeutic window can range from anywhere between like three minutes to 20 minutes. But you, if you start to get to 30, 40, 50 minutes of this intense, you're right, this intense aberrated light, then yeah, you're gonna cause harm for sure. And the problem these days with blue, perhaps if we were using it for 20 minutes a day, it'd be no issue, right? But we're using this technology and under these light bulbs, basically from sunrise until after sunset. Um, and it's really becoming an issue because we're overdoing it. We're really starting to burn out those blue light receptors in our eyes and skin. We're, we're really confusing them. We're confusing the timing mechanism. And that's having some pretty major health consequences, in my opinion. And we'll talk about the health consequences in a minute. But in terms of mitigating that effect inside, because I, I see wearing the, the, I guess they're blue blocking glasses, right? Mm. So what about, you're talking about skin receptors. Mm -hmm. So 
inside, if we're trying to avoid the, the, the blue light, presumably that's just wearing clothes or is all darkness worse than a heavy dose of blue? Mm, interesting. No, like, you know, all darkness at night, if you do all darkness at night, you actually get them, you can get a massive therapeutic benefit from the enhanced melatonin production you're going to get. Um, but during the day we do, we've got sensors for blue light in several places, but there's a concentrated part where we have it, where that's like our primary sensors and that's in the backs of the eyes. And it's not just like, if I were to take the eyes, right? Like a cross section of the eyes, it's not just the entire backs of the eyes. It's like the bottom back of the eyes, which implies that sunlight at a higher angle is what triggers this, right? Like that's what we're looking for. And so when we're indoors, um, yes, the skin, I've had maybe a handful of clients who are very sensitive to the fact that the skin and subcutaneous fat has some blue light sensors to them. Um, and they do have to be more aware of covering themselves up. But for the most part, most people can get away with just being very aware of what light enters their eyes uh, at specific times throughout the day. So before sunrise, I would encourage people to keep the lights dim and to have their lighting lower table lights. I even have people who've got like little lamps that they just put on the floor, the overhead lights, especially when they're full of blue, which is the LEDs um, and compact fluorescence and things like that. That's going to be very triggering to those receptors. Mm -hmm. So if you keep the lights low, you keep them dim and there are specific, specific bulbs people can get. Um, and I just go a step further. I use the orange tones, right? Like I've got one pair right here from Spectra 479. I have no affiliation with them, mm. um, but it's a, a super easy pair to get inexpensive orange. How, mu um, how much does something like that cost? These are about 30 bucks. Oh, okay. This is yeah. Bad. yeah. Not too bad, right? You can get, you can get like fancier ones. These are yeah. fancier, yeah. Um, but like you, you, it runs. Yeah. You can get really good ones for, for pretty darn inexpensive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's like all of a sudden you're just protecting your eyes, these sensors back here from starting to trigger the pathways too soon, mm. because it's that direct connection to the brain that really we have to respect and protect. Mm. Cause the funny thing is, is like, it's a total flip on what we hear in conventional wisdom because conventional wisdom is like, oh, get your polarized sunglasses on when you go outside <laughs> and, you know, put, put sunscreen on because, you know, and, and, but what you're saying is here is almost we need more protection when we're inside mm -hmm. under these lights rather than outside. A hundred percent. We, we absolutely do. Um, we've, we've really vilified UV light. Um, I did a deep dive into the history of UV light and I won't bore you. I did a presentation on it, but I was looking, I was like, just searching, like, show me the studies where there's a, like some, someone who gets massive amounts of UV exposure in from sunlight in a normal way. And it causes drastic issues, right? Cancers and things like that. The research is really sparse. The cancer causing aspect of UV light was studied using just narrow wave UV light, right? Just basically UV light beams without any of the other colors. And in nature, we'd never get ultraviolet light that way. Just like we'd never get blue light the way we're getting it these days. Just like excessive amounts of that red light therapy. Anytime you pull light outside of its natural blend, it has the potential to cause co health consequences or, or, or confusion or challenge to the body. And so, yeah, we, the, people took that information about how, yeah, sure. If I shine, a narrow band UV light on skin for hours at a time, could it cause cancerous cells? A hundred percent it does, right? And it's from that research that we really created this industry of fearing the sun. Um, and we've ignored the studies like the ones out of Sweden that show that people who get the most sun exposure have a 50% reduction in all cause mortality. And you're like, huh, hmm. hmm. Well, that tells that, you know, like you, that has to make you go, hmm, at least, yeah. right? Like, have we been fed a, a, a half truth? A lie <laughs> i don't know but we have to respect the fact that those that sun's been around for a heck of a long time and i would imagine the human body requires uh yeah. requires it <laughs> well the, the the funny thing i'm thinking is that the way our modern system is set up like we, we have people who either you know they live in a wintry climate and then they have they try and go for winter sun and they'll fly out to a hot destination for two weeks and they will get burnt as hell and then I heard someone mention the other day the phrase of a sun callus, mm -hmm. whereby we need to have, you know, built up a certain amount of time in the sun, 
you know, slowly over time. And I guess that's how the seasons change. We're gently exposed to sun over time, you know, throughout the year. We don't, it's very unnatural to go out and, you know, bathe in the sun really like 30 degree heat, you know, Celsius I'm talking about. And, um, and then suddenly go back into a wintry climate. I've, I like, I imagine that, I mean, maybe you could tell us whether that's where the, a lot of the sun damage information comes from. Yeah, it, it does. And that's, and that's also just, you know, people have had their own personal experiences with that where the sun did create a burn, it did create damage. And so that just kind of enhances their or reinforces what we're being told about the sun being damaging and the sun causing harm. But, but so, you're so, exactly so right. Why, it's abusing so, the sun. But why is the sun causing damage in, in that respect rather than, you know, because we're talking about the healing process of the sun, yep. but people can go in the sun and they can get burnt. So what's happening right. there? You hit the nail on the head. The sun, we never, so I live in a Northern latitude where it's the middle of winter right now. And we will always here have a gradual increase in the intensity of the sun. So starting in, starting in, um, in the end of January is when UVB light appears again, which is the wavelength that can make vitamin D. And so basically I meant to pretty much, I would say from March onward, cause it's still pretty cold in January and February from March onward, I meant to get small exposures of sunlight and gradual, gradually build up my tolerance. And so that, that in and of itself helps my body to, to um, optimize certain endogenous UV filtration we have. So again, another thing that that UV light does through the eyes is it transforms histidine, which is another aromatic amino acid in the skin. It's a signal through the eyes, but it converts histidine into histamine and urocanic acid. Urocanic acid is an endogenous UV filter. It will also create more melanin pigmentation in my skin. That melanin pigmentation is another endogenous UV filter. And lastly, it creates a histamine reaction. So the very last thing that happens with sun exposure is I get a pinkening of the skin, which a lot of people falsely think as a sun burn, but it's what in the literature you call an erythema response. That pinkening is my signal. Carrie, you've been in direct sunlight for a heck of a long time get into the shade. Mm. And everybody would have kind of, you know, historically everybody would have recognized that and would have done just that. But you're right. We, we just don't use sun the right way. Mm. And picture then what happens Finn, when people go to the beach with sunglasses on, they're blocking the UV signal from creating the urocanic acid from, and they're, so all of a sudden they're just getting massive sunburn happening because their body hasn't layered on the different reactions and different responses. Okay. So, so the light coming through the eyes also stimulates the response from the skin. Yeah. The eyes and through the eyes and on the skin itself. The skin. We'll, but if, mm -hmm. but if you, if you block one of the, if you block one of the, the sort of, uh, I guess, receptors, AKA the eyes, then you're, you're relying solely on the skin to get all that feedback. It's a mismatch. You're creating quite a, mis a confusing mismatch. You're not optimizing the signaling and what the body can do to then create the layers of protection that we have built in. Wow. Wow. And, and in terms of how that feeds back into our circadian rhythm, we need these, we need the start and the end of the day to really have a strong circadian rhythm. We can't, for instance, let's say you, you, you get up late and you head to work, you, you jump straight in the car, you head to work, you spend, um, you know, four hours under UV light, uh, sorry, under, under LED lights. And then you have a lunch break and you think, great, I've got my lunch break. I'm going to get outside. I've got an hour to get some light on my skin, get some light on my eyes. Is that going to be enough to have your body working in sort of an efficient manner? It's better than nothing for sure, because you're getting at least an accurate light signal and that's being communicated to your brain. However, you do miss out on a lot of those dominoes that didn't get triggered in the morning. So while you are getting a benefit what we are, what we're missing is that morning light, you know, that those morning wavelengths. And then again, making sure we recognize and honor darkness because it's only been within the past 150 years that we can really mess that up as well using artificial light. And so it's better than nothing. I don't want to discourage people from doing that, but you have to recognize that the sun looks so different then than it did from sunrise up until that point. And so it's all of these little triggers and cues that we've missed up until then. And if we go out 
side into the morning and we get we're getting the sunshine and we're getting that morning light to stimulate the circadian rhythm and stimulate these hormones what are the things that we do that even if we're doing that might interrupt that and the first thing top of mind for me is is stimulants like caffeine sure caffeine can definitely start one circadian rhythm early early exercise can can kind of start one circadian rhythm quote unquote too early um, eating a huge meal, let's say someone has to eat a huge meal at five o'clock in the morning before sunrise. There, there are secondary timekeepers of the body. They're called zeitgeibers and you kind of want them all to sync up together. So you want the natural cortisol surge that we get from sunrise, from that sunrise, blue, red balance. That actually is what starts to trigger a cortisol surge in our brain and in our bodies. You want that natural cortisol surge to sync up with the morning. And if, I mean, if you want to have your cup of coffee, then that's fine. Cause you'll only kind of modify that surge a little bit. You won't create almost like two different peaks, if you will. Um, and then same thing, you're going to have a meal. Then you're going to kind of start your gut clocks because your gut cells have their own timing mechanism as well. You're going to kind of start your gut going. And then we're meant to, there's a reason why things like testosterone from a circadian perspective peak at around nine o'clock in the morning, morning, because that's when we were either supposed to be making a baby or building a shelter or hunting, right? Like we were really supposed to start things up at that time of day. Um, and so really we're meant to kind of optimize all activity, all that activity and stuff and get it going first thing in the morning. And how long might it take for someone, let's say someone's totally out of line with their circadian rhythm, because it, it, it's been a peak and flow of my life is I notice my, my body clock is way out of line and I go, right, I'm going to have to sort of fight through a few points of resistance here to get myself back in line. And that may well be waking up when I feel really tired so that I can get this, the morning sunlight and accepting that, you know, for a couple of days, I'm going to feel really tired while my body gets used to this stuff. So how long would it take for someone to realign their circadian rhythm? And what are the what is the minimum they can do? Sure. So let's talk about um, my experience with people who have been, who have really off circadian rhythms. We're talking people who are, who classify themselves as night owls. I've only legitimately probably seen three people who are, are night owls who can't, can't really influence their circadian rhythm in all my years. Um, but these people who really call themselves night owls because they can't get to bed before two o'clock in the morning, if they're willing to go camping, they can recover their circadian rhythm in three to four days intact circadian rhythm three to four days it's pretty impressive if that's not feasible for someone and we're doing more uh, let's let's get the light exposures what as as we need to and you know also live a live a normal life um i've seen three days if someone's really diligent and re at least i've seen sh good positive shifts in the right direction in three days but someone who's got a very dysfunctional circadian rhythm it could take a month or two for them to really start to sync things back up um it's but it's consistency right it's about consistency not necessarily perfection get your sunrise hit get your uva light hit see see the sunset which can be really helpful for people who have got are kind of phase shifted into the night see the sunset because that's where blue light goes away in your environment and then put that eye protection on and you'll start to recognize your brain will start to recognize darkness and sleep so if you can kind of get those pieces in place it'll it'll start to happen on average i would say um 14 days. Okay. Okay. There's our benchmark. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a little bit about it earlier, but water, how mm -hmm. does water and this quantum health and quantum physics fit into maybe another layer of what we previously understand around water, which is, I guess, hydration. Right. Like, we, yeah, you know, in all my studies from undergrad, even through um, my master's program in nutrition, water was either stay hydrated, right? Drink enough water or it was water is an inert solvent. It's like, an, it, it's like part of the body, but really doesn't participate in a ton of stuff in the body. Um, and I'm now what we, what we now know over the past about three decades of research is that the water in our bodies is not like the liquid we see in a glass. It doesn't just slosh around, which I wish they would update all of these textbooks, these biology textbooks. Cause when I see a picture of a cell in a textbook, it basically looks like a water balloon with a couple of things floating in it, like a nucleus, a mitochondria, and you know, and that's not actually how it is at all. The water in our body is structured. It, or it reorganizes the H's and the O's to, into a structured lattice. And that actually provides physical energy for the body. 
And so this was a game changer, right? To understand, because if we were to look at water in a glass and everyone knows, right? Water H2O. If I'm looking at water in a glass under like a quote unquote molecular microscope, you have a big oxygen, right? That's more negative, And you've got these two hydrogens. So two H's and an O and they're bound together covalently and they're interacting with other H2Os and what's called hydrogen bonding. And the hydrogen bonding is kind of loose, right? It's kind of random. It's I'm going to, this, this H2O is going to pair up here. Now it's going to pair up here and it's going to kind of slosh around and it creates the phase that we call liquid, right? Water as a liquid. But in our body, that water takes on a fourth phase. It's called a liquid crystalline structure, which means that the water, mo the molecules become ordered. Instead of being this willy nilly H2O here, H2O here, you, it actually, if you were to look at it under a, a molecular microscope, you see a hexagon. And at the vertices of the hexagon is the oxygen. And between the vertices are hydrogen. And as it organizes itself like that, it actually changes its molecular formula from H2O to H3O2. And that, unlike, unlike water, that's just H2O water that we would call neutral. You know, that goes back to chemistry, having a charge. It has no charge. It's neutral. Water in this structured form has a negative charge. And to create that negative charge, it kicks out a hydrogen, which is the most basic atom on the periodic table, which is just basically a proton and a, sometimes a tiny little electron with it. And so you've got like this negatively charged structured water that forms at near every biological surface. So cell membranes around every protein, every cytoskeleton, every extracellular matrix, every organelle, everything in the body create, you have the biological surface this structured negatively charged lattice of H3O2 and a proton, a hydrogen right here lining up. And when microelectrodes get stuck in the proton area and in the H3O2, the negative charge, the positive and the negative, it lights a light bulb. There's plenty of potential energy buried in the water structure of our body to give the body potential energy to do work. And so we've also been fed, I think, a uh, half truth that food is the only way that we get energy for our bodies. I mean, there's, there's so much there that blows my mind. <laughs> but so, so, so in terms of how that energy is released, that's released in the same downstream mechanism in terms of ATP and the mitochondria and, and electrons, or how is that, how do we actually generate energy from that? Well, you energy relies on a, a what's called a charge separation. So look at any battery. You have a concentrated area of, let's say, electrons, you know, negative end that need to flow, right? And so in order to in order to generate electricity, there just has to be charge separation. And then eventually you connect it all and the electricity flows. And so what we have is basically electrical wiring in the body. We've got this ability to flow energy throughout the body um, in the form of this structured water. So it, it becomes a, a potential energy around every protein, around every membrane, but it also becomes a conduit, very much like wiring, through which we now know it's called exclusion zone water, easy water. And it's called that because the only thing that can get into it, it excludes everything but electrons, right? And so basically uh, protons can start to kind of de degrade the lattice, um, but the electrons themselves, it's a channel for electron flow and, and moving electrons is electricity. Electricity powers us in the same way it powers all of our devices. And so it's hard, um, it's hard to really flip that mindset from going st strictly from biochemistry to this more quantum physics perspective. But uh, it's a game changer when you start to apply certain strategies that optimize the structured water in the body. Uh, and you'll, people definitely notice a benefit then. And in terms of the mitochondria, right? Mitochondria, we've heard, we've, we've all heard that mitochondria make ATP. That's called step five of the electron transport chain where they take electrons and kind of pass them through. But step four of the electron transport chain that I think is the star of the show and it gets ignored that is where water gets made. That's where the oxygen we breathe actually ultimately forms water inside of the mitochondrion, which ultimately becomes water inside of the cell. So the mitochondria are just water generators for a reason, right? That water makes a difference in terms of then having that cellular hydration forms a battery of potential energy. And um, that's, that's, how, that's how there's breatharians in this world, Finn. That's how there's people who can really survive without yeah. the need for food. Well, that was going to be the next question that I have is to what extent is this all symbiotic and that each step needs each other? 
you know, we maybe need a little bit of macronutrients for X, Y, and Z, and we need, but we can, you know, diminish that intake a hell of a lot and still survive. So you're talking about breatharians. I mean, let's go into, let's go into that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like things that I never thought that existed or that I would study, but you know, there are, I've met with and studied breatharians because it's, a, I like anomalies and things that make you go, hmm. And you have to recognize that these people actually have been studied in lab settings, in, in lab settings too. And they have uh, one of them, I, it was at least 10 years that he hadn't had any food or water um, and was studied in a, in, in a lab setting for at least seven days without food or water, which would have killed pretty much a lot of us, right? What they recognized was he was just so, uh, it, they didn't come up with this conclusion, right? But the conclusion becomes, he must have been very darn good at extracting energy from other sources besides food. And it just so turns out that we now know that the water in our bodies is this, has this energy potential with some estimates of it providing two thirds of our energy production, like our energy needs. So uh, perhaps he was able to max that out a little bit higher. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a fascinating concept. So I would say that we have to at least acknowledge it as a main contributor to energy in the body. And yeah, do I think the majority of us who, you know, this, these individuals happen to be living really in touch with nature outside, right? You know, more of a Buddhist, maybe the outside meditation lifestyle. Um, do I think that I could do that? No, I absolutely can't. I need nutrients, right? I absolutely need some of those building blocks and nutrients of my body. But do I think that I have the same reliance on food for energy that I once thought I needed? Absolutely not. That's shifted massively. And I can really sense that my body can use pull energy from things like that exclusion zone water battery and even things like earthing and grounding, right? Because the currency of energy in the body that becomes electricity, it becomes electrons and electron flow. And if I can optimize that, I have more energy. Yeah, because the thing I'm thinking of now is that there are these systems within the body. I mean, just even on a top line nutrition level, like we've got energy from fat system, you know, ketosis, all of these systems that if you don't access them, on a regular basis, then they atrophy or the body finds it more and more difficult to access, you know, so even stuff like we hear is such, such conventional wisdom for di digestive health is like you need fiber. And really, the body does not need fiber at all. It's just indigestible stuff. And you know, so then the picture emerges in the mind of like some sort of sewage pipe that needs these sort of boulders going through to clear out stuff, really, you know, you're just putting boulders in the system. So all of this conventional wisdom sort of builds on top of each other until we're in a situation where really the conventional wisdom is totally wrong and it's probably doing us more damage. So what, to what extent is maybe our dietary stuff now, you know, where you're talking about these systems, you know, this, this sort of energy from water system and stuff, does that atrophy or, and, and are, are, are we able to promote that system more in ourselves? Yeah, it absolutely, uh, it diminishes. I won't say it atrophies, it, it diminishes because it gets maintained. Now it will form anytime water, anytime H2O comes into contact with a biological surface, it will structure itself. But the degree to which it will structure itself or maintain that structure really actually depends on a specific wavelength range of light. So again, here's where light comes into play. Because what we now know, and this is again, the work out of Dr. Gerald Pollack's lab at the University of Washington, and he wrote the, a book called The Fourth Phase of Water, which really dives into this, but he makes it accessible. And I really appreciate him because he's taking some insanely complex quantum electrodynamics of water and bringing it to like, oh, I actually understand what this dude's talking about, right? And how it's happening in the body. But what he has shown, has shown in his research is that this, this, exclusion zone water lattice will get diminished when it's exposed to wireless radiation and it will expand when it's exposed to infrared light and um, wireless radiation you're talking about that that's like wi-fi internet wi-fi internet cell phone bluetooth bluetooth all that stuff exactly right exactly and picture how many of us are like just surrounded by it all the time i mean so, um, sometimes i even sleep with you know to my shame i sleep with you know white noise on because i'm in mexico it's kind of a little loud loud but i use the phone to bluetooth that white noise sound to my speaker so right. like it clicked the other day i was like maybe that's not so good 
<laughs> Maybe I'm, yeah. I mean, it, and I think we all have a threshold, right? I think everyone's got an ability to tolerate it up to a point, but knowing that, that it diminishes the size of the exclusion zone, it's easy to see how we're essentially stealing energy from this battery. And instead, then are we going to be more reliant on food? A hundred percent we are. Because there's also another source of electrons, which is earthing, touching the bare, our bare feet to the earth, which is a whole nother topic. And it might be way too woo for people. Um, but so if you think about if I'm not getting, if I'm diminishing that exclusion zone water, if I am not getting electrons in other ways, then of course, food's going to be my primary energy source, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, but if we actually start to recognize that you can get energy, I, I call it energy from massless sources, right? Like earthing and the sun, uh, we start to rely less on food and we need food for nutrients, not sustenance. So we, uh, so, so, so this battery then gets charged. He's his lab showed that it can expand fourfold. This exclusion zone can expand fourfold, which would then also co- create a larger concentration of protons here. You, so you basically charge that battery up fourfold with exposure to infrared wavelengths of light, which come from the sun, right? The sun has that infrared. Some of it we feel is heat. Some of it we don't, but it's infrared. Hence why I think Northern latitude cultures have a massive infrared influence in them. For for example, uh, you would see like in Norwegian countries, you see a lot of sauna use. Mm -hmm. Even in, uh, if you look at uh, indigenous populations in uh, Northern Canada, there's always like, you always have a fire as the primary source of, you know, where you're spending your time. And so infrared is a way to, uh, from fire is also, and heat is a way to kind of supplement sunlight when the sunlight's missing during winter months, Mm -hmm. darkness and cold. And that's that's totally fascinating. And and what I think is in terms of when people are we programmed on a genetic level to be more receptive to those <clears throat> different energy sources? You know, for instance, I've just moved to Me- I've moved to Mexico nearly a couple of years ago now. And, you know, I'm now in a tropical place the whole time, whereas the first 28 years of my life, I was in this very seasonal environment with periods of cold, periods of different light levels and and everything in between so can we shift that in ourselves or are we programmed to function best as either a northern hemisphere southern hemisphere or tropical region oh it's such a fascinating topic right and so that would take us to this idea of our mitochondria and our mitochondria which make that water for us they come from what's called the maternal lineage You get your mitochondria from your mom who got them from her mom, her mom, her mom, her mom. And so uh, there's a researcher, Dr. Doug Wallace. He's like the preeminent mitochondrial researcher in the world out of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he really was the one who was like, oh, we only get our mitochondria from one side. And so he traced it back. You can trace these lineages back tens of thousands of years even. And um, you can you can get a snapshot of what's called your mitochondrial haplogroup from something like 23andMe. You know, if someone wants to, you know, I'm not necessarily going to tell anyone to get a DNA test, but if anyone's done that, you can go ahead and take a look and see your mitochondrial haplogroup and you'll see where your mitochondria came from. So for example, one of my colleagues who lives in Florida hates the cold, hates everything about cold exposure, cold plunges, If he does cold too much, it takes him forever for his body to heat up afterwards. And so his mitochondria originated what what would be what would be called L1, which is right on the equator. And so his mitochondria couldn't do something called uncouple and generate heat. So mitochondria are heat generators for us. If we have them that came, if our mitochondria come from a, a population that had to migrate away from the equator and experience the seasons, they had to figure out how to heat up the body. My mitochondria, on the other hand, uncouple beautifully. I'm a J, right? I'm a J. I'm from like Northern Europe. Those mitochondria, I I look forward to the cold here Mm. this time of year because it's like, oh yeah, I needed this. My mitochondria can, can handle this no problem. And so, yeah, if you're looking at it like that, there are some... Um, influences that might optimize our physiology to our location or vice versa, our location, our physiology. But I think as long as we're living close to the circadian rhythm of where we're at, our body can handle it pretty darn well. Yeah. It's interesting you should say, because I absolutely crave the cold sometimes. I don't know whether it's because I'm in the extreme heat here, but I, the, the thing I'd say, you know, even the pipes coming, the water into the house, is hot. I mean, it's warm. Like that's as cold as it goes because it's going through like warm land. All the pipes are going through warm land. So what I what I've tended to do is I get a big ten liter jug, 
10 litre water bottle and I'll leave it in the fridge overnight. And in the morning, I'll dump it over myself. Oh, so yes. that, that's, as, that's as close to the cold I can get. I feel amazing when I get that dose of cold. Um, and I've always been, <clears throat> my body has always run hot. Like, so when I'm in a hot place, I'm always, I'm overheating. So, you know, I'm, I, I feel, you know, intrinsically just sort of instinctively, like I feel there's definitely something there where I do, I love the heat, but I function better in the cold. So like, whether I like it or not, I think I'm a cold climate guy. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to live in a cold climate, but just recognize that, you know, if you got access to a cold shower or a cold plunge, my buddy Ryan, who uh, lives in that area, he's actually traveled the world a bit, but I remember the first time I saw him in one of his videos, uh, he found a trash bin and filled it with ice cubes. Right. And he was just like, he, he'd been in Mexico for a couple of years and he was just like, my body, he, my body needs the cold, you know, and he's from, he's from England, you know, so he obviously needed like his, his, mm. his mitochondria were like, please, please give me a shock of cold. You know, I've been missing it. So exactly. yeah, I, I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. So the other thing I wanted to touch on is, is we, as humans, we, we have all these effects on us that you're telling us, you know, effects of the, the light spectrums in our eyes and the effects of uh, the light spectrum on our skin and different water charges and everything in between. So the food that we eat, for instance, the eggs that we get from chickens, the meat that we get from cows, the or, or any other animals, what effect is the light having on them that might impact our nutrition that we get from the products? Well, you know, it, it's interesting to think that food's been uh, analyzed quite a bit from a quantitative perspective, but not necessarily qualitative, the qualities of it. And what I mean by that is those electrons in that animal tissue could be plant tissue as well, right? Plant matter, but that's all electrons. And those electrons hold light information. Those, those creatures were living outside, hopefully under light, right? And if they were living under local light, you were, you're basically getting that light energy from those electrons as they go through your electron transport chain. It can either sink your circadian rhythm, it can kind of sink all of this quantum communication of, oh yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's the middle of winter, you know, this is a fish that, that Carrie caught in, in uh, you know, two weeks ago in the stream and she's, you know, it's, it all sinks up and the electrons come in, it all sinks together versus a very, con it can be a very confusing signal when we have animals that are either transported thousands of miles or their products are transported thousands of miles. Same with thing with plants. If I were up here in the middle of winter in Michigan to eat a bunch of pineapples that don't grow here this time of year, that releases a different type of light. And it does, it actually changes how the electrons flow through the mitochondria. It changes signaling in there. Um, and not to say that it's, it's the worst thing in the world, but it can confuse an already a circadian rhythm that's already confused. Let's just say it's not helping. It, it might not help the situation. And so I think it's really important for us to find local seasonal sources of food, because that's what we would have done had we had to have our own access to find our own food, hunt our own food, even grow our own food. It would be here in our location, in our season. And that's just going to sync up what's circadian available uh, to, to my body, which just kind of, it's called creates coherence. It creates a coherent signal mm -hmm. of what's happening in my environment and then inside of my body. So this is like a spectrum, really. It's like you're laying, layering in levels of optimization to get to, you know, I guess it's never going to be perfect because we're imperfect beings, but we can strive further and further away from wildly imperfect. And one of those is to try and, you know, find animals and, and food sources that are in our local vicinity. Yeah. You know, I think that's really good for our circadian health. I also think it's just, it's good practice. It's good practice for the planet. So, yeah. I mean, I'd, and, I'd rather promote that. <laughs> and so, so I'd, I'd heard little bits about, you know, chickens that are laying eggs that have never seen sunlight, you know, they're always under LEDs. So how's that impacting like the nutrition of an egg? Do you know, no one has done that research yet, mm -hmm. right? I'm certain it, it is. I'm certain it's changing the amount of the things like vitamin A, uh, uh, DH. I'm, I am certain it is, but who knows? Because mm -hmm. no one, because right now, currently the, the paradigm is light is light. 
Is it enough light to grow something, to raise something, even if it's a completely foreign light source? That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of just on the cusp of getting people to the awareness that the light matters and the spectrum of light matters and specifically the full spectrum of sunlight would be ideal. And so I'm hoping that at some point we'll know that information, but, but we just don't right now. Yeah. Because that's the other thing I think of coming down the tracks is like, we're looking at so much technology coming into our farming systems now. And it's like this, this hydroponic under led light culture of growing that many people think is going to save us and our food system. And it's, it's one of these things we're marching to false pretenses. You know, and, and it could be that one, one view, one lens is that this is the only way we feed a starving planet is by te bringing this technology into place. And the other lens is that this is just going to lead to more nutrient deficiencies down the line. And the only way is to go back to sustainable regenerative agriculture, which is on a localized level. Yeah, 100% agree with that. You're absolutely right. You know, short term, it sounds glorious uh, the, the hydroponic style of growing, but long-term, I don't know what type of nutrients and signaling that's going to have in the body long-term in the same way that I don't like, I don't think it's sustainable or healthy to have the signaling that happens from, for me eating, you know, an avocado right now. It's mm -hmm. just, I, I think we have to think way closer to sustainable local regenerative. If we're ever going <laughs> to, if we're ever going to really get things to where in the direction that we need them to go. Yeah. Yeah. I did see, you know, funny enough, I did actually see a map of the new regenerative farms in the USA that were propping up. And I think the stat they gave was 500,000 acres of new regenerative agriculture land has come up in the last like 10 years. So I do have hope, but it's whether the, the, the prevailing narrative gets on top of us too fast. You know, we're talking about meat taxation and all of these other things that are rolling in. And, you know, that's sort of political rather than anything, but it's, it's whether this information gets out on the nuances of nutrition and the nuances of health because that's what is going to save us is, is the understanding the nuances rather than marching to the beat of dogmas yeah you know what the 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 change has to happen from the consumer the consumer has to be educated because it's not going to happen from the top down it has to happen from the demand coming from us and so that's my whole goal in uh, one of my goals besides you know letting empowering people to change their health or support their health it's giving them the knowledge to have a conversation and just some critical thinking of, wait a second, that doesn't make sense when someone's telling me it needs to be done that way. Mm, exactly. And um, we're going to, we're going to wrap things up in a minute. And I just want to know, are there people that you would really recommend people to go and look at the research where this is coming out from? Where can people like really get their teeth into this sort of quantum oh, health research? Gosh, yes. Um, so there is, you know, Jack Cruz, like I said, has massive amounts of blogs on his Patreon. If you're looking to stick your face into a fire hydrant of information, right? Like a flowing fire hydrant, mm -hmm. then that's where you could go. Um, there is then if you're looking for, for, uh, books, um, I can't recommend Dr. Pollock's book enough, the fourth phase of water. Um, there's also, uh, there's a book that was written, Oh, probably about 10 years ago now by two uh, researchers. One was a, one's a biologist and one's a physicist, uh, Jim, Jim Al Khalili and John Joe McFadden. And it's not about, it's, it's, a, it's meant for the, you know, average person, right? And it's not about the quantum biology happening in humans, but it's, it's the first book that was put together about, wait a second, we used to think quantum only happened in ultra cooled, ultra cold vacuum like environments. And he, they put together where it's happening in animals and in living systems. So that's another interesting book uh, that's called life on the edge. Um, another, another book to kind of get people in, um, you know, I've got a million of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, earthing is a fascinating one. If you're interested, that's a fun one. And there's actually some earthing documentaries. Like if you really want to understand what's going on kind of from that electron flow perspective, there's some great documentaries and the earthing Institute has a lot of research mm -hmm. there. And then lastly, some, there's some Vimeos. Now this is kind of next level education. If you're maybe a practitioner, but it's uh, Alexander Wunsch. He's called the light doctor and he's really put together on Vimeo, some interesting presentations, kind of what I was talking about, how the light interacts with the body and what maybe biochemistry or photoendocrine uh, hormonal effects it has. So that's another person that I would direct people to. Fantastic. And where can people find out more about you and your work and, um, and what's coming up for you in the future? 
Okay. Well, you know, my main hub is Instagram, uh, Carrie B wellness. So I try to post topics like these types of topics pretty much every day. Uh, it's a great place to go to kind of dip your toe in. And then that from, from my link tree in my bio is where I will really, uh, I really announce all the things that I have. So I do have a course it's geared towards, uh, pe like people who are working on their own health and it goes into how to apply all this stuff. Right. Okay. I, I buy into it, Carrie. I get that light and water and electrons and mitochondria are important. Just tell me what to do. And so it, it's me. So you're not just going to get a protocol. You're going to get science. I need you to understand some of the science but how to apply it. So there's that available. And if you're a practitioner, uh, there's an organization called the Quantum Biology Collective. We are, we are, we have it, we've uh, created, or they've created, I'm teaching a uh, level one certification in applied quantum biology, how to take this into clinical practice, no matter what you're doing, whether you're a doctor, a chiropractor, massage therapist, you name it. Uh, and so that's all again, I think Instagram's a great hub to start off with. And I have all that information in my bio. Fantastic. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And I've learned a lot today. You've kind of blown my mind. But um, I hope we can catch up again in the future. Oh, yeah, Finn, this was a blast.